good series. Previous talks were very good too. Today we're talking about um, poverty and social inequality. And excuse my voice, I, I lost my voice from, would you believe it, fishing too much. It's, it's amazing, but it's true. The, it's possible, it's possible. But um, <laughs> the um, poverty and inequality have become the defining issues of our day, undoubtedly. If you don't believe me, just follow the American elections. The whole prospect of Donald Trump being, you know, not an outside contender for being the president of the U.S. is based on the trends in poverty and inequality uh, and uh, the support among the, the bottom half of the U.S. population has been neglected so long as a result of these trends. And these trends transpose themselves into all countries, ours not included, and these trends manifest themselves largely, um, we're talking about in developed economies, uh, of which we are the richest, according to the latest OECD statistics. So I'm going to talk about three things in my talk today. Number one, I'm going to talk about these economic trends globally, technologically, what they mean. Secondly, I'm going to talk about, very importantly, domestic conditions, domestic policy, how that amplifies it in the case of Singapore, and how that is the root cause of the kind of poverty, the kind of inequality uh, that we see today. It's important to understand because if you don't understand that, it's hard to, to talk about. Um, policy remedies. And thirdly, I'll talk about the policy remedies in detail. I'll talk about figures, I'll talk about affordability, I'll talk about where they should be targeted. <coughs> and, then, um, and then we open up the floor to, to discussion. Okay, so first slide, please. <coughs> so the, the two major trends that you want to think about globally are, uh, are the trends of, in the first place, uh, the great doubling, the first trend. Secondly, is the great innovation. The great doubling is the joining of the global, to the global labor force of the um, huge rural masses heretofore living in Asian pover in poverty. Um, but now for the first time, good news is about to join the global labor force and uh, absolute poverty as we know it will in a few decades time largely be eliminated. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is it's going to be at the expense of the poor in the rich world. And these will provide, these people will provide a great deal of competition, global markets and relocation of factories. That's the whole basis of both Donald Trump as well as Bernie Sanders' campaigns, uh, as well as direct competition through the trade markets. Uh, and this will stagnate and cap wages in median for blue collar workers uh, in the developed economies. The second, Innovation in IT, you don't, I don't have to talk too much about. There's restructuring, there's outsourcing. And most recently, you've heard the Oxford studies in artificial intelligence. And they have dire predictions that in 30 years, 40% of the jobs as we know them, including professional jobs, will be entirely replaced by software and a bit of hardware. Okay, so uh, this being the labor market future, I want you to look at this chart. This is a very important chart. This explains uh, most Mr. Trump and Mr. Sanders. This is the U.S. economy, and I'm looking at uh, real wages on average uh, from the 70s through to through uh, early part of the noties. Um, you can see that, you know, for a long time, for a decade or so, both what is the red line, the average wages of managers and owners of capital, the professional classes, the businessmen, the elite, economic elite, as well as the average wages, the median wages in the whole economy, and blue-collar average wage workers, they moved in tandem remarkably for a long time. And then, at the time when this globalization began with China, at the time when these technological changes began to gain traction, they moved like this. And this is the kind of poverty and inequality we're looking at today, right? And it's a special kind of inequality. Not only is the dispersion between here and here at levels, and not just here, this is just maybe 10%, if you're talking about the 1%, 0.01%, you're talking about <laughs> there, right? So we haven't seen this since the Gilded Ages, 1920s, where you know, Scott Fitzgerald said that the rich are not like the rest of us, and they were not. And we haven't seen this since actually the medieval ages, since the rich were not like any of, of the rest of us, right? So, what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is, is this trend continues in labor markets unless there's serious intervention by the state, 
unless there's serious reallocation, uh, redistribution by the state. This is the natural trend of the economy, right? And this natural trend of the economy is poisonous to society. It's not just a policy issue, it's a political legitimacy issue, as you can see by the prospect of Mr. Trump's might become the president of the US, right? We are talking about a rise of a neo-fascism. Whenever political economic orders are so threatened that the masses are confused, that the masses no longer believe in the legitimacy of the order, what rises both on the right and the left in, in the age past was communism and fascism. In this age, it is Sanders and Trump, right? And you see that echoed in all the, all the major developed economies, this theme. So this is an important theme. This is an important chart. Next chart, please. <coughs> Singapore is no exception. Next chart, please. Now, in Singapore, we've taken great pains to make things a bit worse for ourselves <laughs> by the brilliant economic policies of the 1990s and 2000s, which I believe, in my humble opinion, the biggest policy mistake that you know, our government has had unfortunate, unfortunate unintended privilege of, of making, which is that we massively increased unskilled and semi-skilled foreign labor to drive what is called growth-oriented policy. We are going for growth, we are maximizing growth. Growth was close in this decade to 5 to 10 percent, closer to the 10 percent side in many, in many sub-periods. And we grew our population from 1990, 3 million, 2009, 2010, nearly 5 million, 2 million, mostly foreign, mostly non-residents, which are unskilled foreign workers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <coughs> These are the unskilled foreign residents. They increased by 1.3 million over these two decades. 300,000 are domestic workers, but 1 million strong depressed the wages of our working classes, of cashiers, of salespeople, of factory workers, of truck drivers, of bus drivers, Anyone you care to mention at the bottom had their wages severely dampened by this. So wage depression is only one element of it. Next slide, please. You can see this in the Singapore's data. This is the top decile. The bottom decile goes down, the middle decile goes flat, just like from in this period, just like the US. Next slide, please. Now this chart is extremely important. This chart shows what happens in the long-term future, and it's an important long-term choice we all have to make. This purple line and the green line shows different labor force growth scenarios of our labor force going out to 2050 from 2010. This is what the white paper should have shown you, but did not. Okay, this is um, what the population of Singapore will end up at in that terminal date. So this is 20 million, this is 8 million, 10 million, and so forth. And you can see that should our population continue to grow at the rate it grew in the last 20 years when we had this great policy mistake, 3.5% labor force growth, we would end up in 2050, 62% uh, for new foreigners. What's that? Did I hear 6.9 million? I'm hearing it's 18 to 20 million here. Okay, so that's this kind of, that kind of Dutch auction. If we were to be on the highest side of uh, DPM Thurman's one, and a half, one to two percent uh, labor force growth rate that he enunciated in the 2010 Economic Strategies Review Committee, if we were to be on the highest side of that, one and a half to two, we will end up with 10 to 11 million, not 6.9. This is the bad news, all right? In order to get well below seven, which is the enunciated intention of the Prime Minister at the last parliamentary hearing on the White Paper, he said that himself, we have to grow the labour force 1% or below, we'll end up at 6.5 million here. But this requires a great deal of investment. What can you imagine a Singapore of 10 versus 7? In terms of poverty, well, people will be as rich as now or, or better, hopefully, but in terms of inequality, in terms of social divisions, it will be more like Dubai than the Switzerlands we, we once aspired to be. Okay, so in terms of inequality, in terms of wealth inequality, imagine the differential between living in Bishan, which by then will have a density of Kowloon's, 
among cooks and living in Bukitima, which will have the same density today. That is the kind of social inequality we are talking about. That is the kind of society. And if you think that xenophobia is bad today, imagine xenophobia then. Will it be governable? Will we be governable? Will we feel like Singaporeans at all? This is the choice. So the policy alternative is keep labor force growth below 1%. The only way we're going to ensure that over this period of time is to have, like all other OECD countries, immigration quotas every year. All right? Now it's immigration by corporate demand. You, you satisfy certain things, you pay some taxes, you get, your, you get your workers, and how many workers we get is a residual. It's up to how much the corporations pay. We can no longer afford that. Next slide, please. This is the choice. Switzerland or Dubai. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about inequality. I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about inequality. Uh, this is the, the standard, uh, what you call, Gini coefficient. We've seen zero is best, is perfectly, um, perfect income is perfectly distributed. One income it belongs to only one person in the economy. And in between, by the time you get at the point 0.4, 0.5, it is by OECD standards beginning to get unacceptable. Singapore, I'm only going up to 2010 because um, I'll describe the rest. This is to show the trend that resulted from those kinds of policies. We were at 0.47 in extremely high, higher than most OECD countries, although to be fair, at roughly the same level as major OECD cities. Hong Kong was slightly higher than us. We were roughly the same as London and uh, New York and London was slightly higher. We were in that neighborhood. Now, I want you to notice that after income and taxes and benefits, you can bring this down significantly. And in the latest data, if you go out to 2016, excuse me, I'll sit down. If you go out to, 20, if you go out to 2016, we will come down to below 0.431, right? So this is great. What this shows you is that policy makes a difference. We don't have to accept the fate of the markets, the fate that the markets deal to us is a fatal fate, right? It's, it's something that, that's going to take us where we don't want to go. So we can redistribute. Now, un unfortunately, even after this redistribution, we're redistributing only half as much as the U.S. redistributes. The U.S. doesn't redistribute that much, and only a third or quarter as much as the European countries. So we can do a lot more, and there's, scope to be done, there's work to be done here. Next slide, please. I want to talk about why is inequality so bad before I talk about poverty. Because it's more obvious why poverty, poverty is bad. People say, so what if we are unequal, right? As long as the people at the bottom move up, I don't mind inequality. I don't care how rich other people are. Um, unfortunately, this is not true because we are social animals. And there have been good studies to show, to show this. The study I want you to, to, to know is a study by... Peter Wilkinson and Kathleen Pickett, they wrote a book called The Spirit Level about, about 10 years ago. They are epidemiologists, that means to say they're the best users of long-term statistics, much better than economists around. And they showed the following. High levels of income inequality, and this is an index of social problems. What were the problems they examined that were quantitatively measured and standardized? Levels of trust mental illness, life expectancy, even infant mortality, levels of obesity, teenage births, homicides, delinquency, imprisonment rates, and social mobility. If you standardize all of these scores, you'll see this pattern. The higher the income inequality, the higher the level of these social ills, right? So there's no causal relationship spelled out here. The causal relationships will be in the work of people like Yu Yen. She suggested a lot of them this, uh, earlier on, right? These are the kind of psycholo socio-psychological causes that cause people to have these kinds of problems when there's this kind of in income inequality. But the results at the macro level are undeniable. Next slide, please. And Singapore is extremely vulnerable because we as a society are here. This is the USA. We are here in this region. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. This is imprisonment rates. 
can see the relationship here. Next slide, please. Importantly, social mobility is negatively correlated to income inequality. Why so? Think about it. The higher the income inequality, the more well-off parents are able to give their kids the, better, the, the, the head starts in life, the tuition, the enrichment, the contacts that will ensure they never fall into other levels, lower socioeconomic levels, and therefore prevent other people from moving up. Mobility is important because, as Yu Yen said, talking about inequality, nobody aspires to complete equality. Let's be frank. Nobody aspires to live in a society with equal outcomes completely. As long as they're not too extreme, what we aspire to, what is more important to us, is equality of opportunity rather than opportunity of outcomes. And mobility is a direct measure of equality of opportunity. And higher the income inequality, the less equality of opportunity. The less political legitimacy. All right, okay, so let's go next. And you can see USA is here. Let's go. <coughs> so next, next slide, please. So we've also had higher volatility. We had four recessions and two major financial crises in the last 13 years, well, whereas we had only two in the first 30 years of independence, right? We have higher structural unemployment, and we have a huge pool of older workers in my cohort, baby boomers, who only had primary six education about to enter retirement years. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk. So I've talked about inequality, and the last thing I'll say about that inequality is that if you can actually reduce income inequality in society, you can actually, at some level, have a huge macro force that mitigates all those problems. Um, and if I can just go back a few slides, please. Can you go back to that imprisonment slide? Okay, look at imprisonment. Look at the raw, what we economists call the raw score, and look at which is the actual numbers of people imprisoned per 100,000, okay? Look at the degree of inequality here, and we're talking about moderate changes between Australia and Singapore, Australia and Denmark, let's say. Now, the point is this. Modest changes in income inequality, let's say between Belgium and Australia, which is not all that great, modest significant changes, produce a huge increase in raw scores. It goes up from 50 to 150, right? So if you're a policymaker and you want to say, I want to lower imprisonment rates, lower delinquency rates, lower uh, teenage pregnancies and all that, you have a choice. You can have more policemen on the streets or you can have more policemen on the streets and you can help them by lowering income inequality. There's a trade-off there. So lowering income inequality is a powerful policy tool for increasing social well-being and lowering the incidence of all these social ills. Important to know. Okay, next, let's go back again. Go back again to, one more back, profile of, I'll talk about absolute poverty. Yu Yen talked about, she gave you a hint of what it feels like to be poor on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm talking about absolute poverty. I'm talking about meeting basic needs on a monthly basis. The, meeting, the basic needs I'm talking about are, are food, Rent, housing, I'm talking about transport, basic transport to school and work. I'm talking about basic medical. If you're sick, you need to go to the doctor, you can go to the doctor. That's all, okay? And economists have done some work. How much that takes is about $500 per capita for family. If you have a family of four, you need about $2,000 to be able to meet those basic needs. If you don't, if you have, as for the bottom 5 to 10% of our population, a working population, full-time work, if you are like them, you earn more like 1,000 to and supporting a family of four of 2,000, then either you don't get enough to eat or your kids don't get enough to eat, there's a choice, or your kids don't have enough money for recess at school, or 
you don't have enough money to pay the utilities and rent, and it gets shut off now and then. Your kids have to take water containers to school, take water home so they make sure they can bathe. Or the kids and you have to buy candles, study by candlelight in an HDB flat, or kerosene lamps. And then there's a spate of new fires in low-income communities called uh, api lilin, which is, means to say candle fires. And these are the problems of the poor, besides the bed bugs, besides the washing in cold water. All right? These are the psychological and physical problems that I'm talking about here. This is the definition. And under this definition, the working poor form about 70 to 90,000 of Singapore households. One member fully employed, but earning less than 1750 to 2000 per capita. Another 20 to 30,000 are the elderly poor. Another 20 to 30,000 are the unemployed poor, and altogether they form 10% of resident households. Roughly 350 to 400,000 Singaporeans live like that. Okay? So, next, next slide, please. I want to talk about the first category, which is working poor. So what can we do about it? What are the policies that can get to the heart of the problem? There are a few. We already have some of them. Now, for the working poor, I'm talking about those people I mentioned just now, 75, 90,000 households, one person fully unemployed, earning 1,300 instead of 1,700. You need the gap between the market wage and the living wage, between this gap. You need about five to six hundred dollars $500 a month. Now, why did this gap exist? This gap existed because of poor policy. This gap existed because we let in all those immigrants, don't forget, one million of them over two decades, and they depressed the, the wages of the people right at the bottom to these levels. If you go to New Zealand, if you go to Australia, if you go to Canada, that has got a lower per capita GDP than us, the people working in McDonald's, working at the service counters, working as construction people, and two to three times as much, their market wage is above their living wage. Our market wage is well below our living wage. This is a result of policy. It was not intended. We got a lot of growth out of it. But it's a policy problem we have to deal with today. This is the gap that we need to fill, and it's best filled with the Workfare Income Supplement, the WIS, and this is a good scheme it's developed by Donald. Where's he? He's, this gentleman here is the guy who went to Wisconsin and convinced the Ministry of Finance and Civil Service to adopt this policy. Okay, give him a hand. This is a great policy because with the Work for Income Supplement, you're paid only if you work. So there's no disincentive to work. In fact, it's the opposite. There's an incentive to work. It's a subsidy. You, you, you get it more of it, you want to work more, not less. So this is a perfect policy tool. The only problem is it's so bloody small. We only give out $150, $250 per month, of which two-thirds is in CPF. So if you're poor, you can't consume CPF on a monthly basis. You know, it doesn't keep you away from the pawnbroker. It doesn't keep you away from the along. You need that money for food, for rent. Okay, so we need more of this. We need the cash portion to go to five to six hundred bucks a month. Easy. In one stroke, next month, a lot of this problem can be solved. Think about it. 70, 90, next month. How much does it cost? It costs another 1.6 billion on top of what we're paying now, 600 million. And this 1.6 billion is only 0.4% of GDP. Okay, um, I, well, I'll tell you right now, actually we've got a structural surplus of about 25 billion. Don't believe what they say when they tell you that we, are, we, we have only a structural surplus of one point something or two point something. It's 25 billion. And the additional cost is 1.6 of that 25 billion. Got it? Next slide, please. 
the next group are the, work, are the elderly poor. The elderly poor are the people you see pushing cardboard, we mentioned it the earlier on, right? Selling cardboard on the streets. The uncles and aunties you see in HDB working their guts out seven days a week with one day off every other week, right? At 70 years old. This is, this is what I'm talking about by the elderly poor, okay? Now, a lot of the MPs are trying to tell us that they'd like to do it for exercise. <laughs> I'd like to see them doing it for exercise. Okay, okay so now, um, this is a big structural problem because there's demographics involved. What is the demographic? The three things are involved. Why are these people there? I've explained to you why the working poor are there, right? The misstep in policy, the excess immigration. Why are the elderly poor there? There are three main reasons. The first reason, again, is the same policy because for the last 20 years of their working life, they've been earning depressed wages. The second reason is history. For the first 20 years of their working life, they were living in a first world economy. Right? We came from first world to third, according to Lee Kuan Yew. So the first half of the working life, third world to first, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Third world to first, right? So we went from, they were working in the period when we went from third from third to second world, and wages were low. And then we depressed the wages for the next 20 years, and now they're retiring. On top of that, half of them have no, have only, have no, don't even have primary six education. So that's the situation they're in. There are three to 400,000 of them. This is the biggest demographic cohort coming through the pipeline, and they don't have enough CPF savings, and they don't have enough retirement, right? So this this is, is the problem. Next slide. But we have a solution. <clears throat> we have recently introduced this year a non-contributory pension called the Silver Support Scheme. All right, this was in this year's budget. It's coming online, I think, next year for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, it's going to reach everybody with $200 a month who is in this low-income category. All low-income poor people are going to get $200 a month. The problem is not this. This is a great scheme, and we should applaud the uh, Ministry of Finance for introducing this, uh, but they are still sadly inadequate. They need to double, to treble that before we're going to make a dent, in it, before those cardboard collectors really have a choice of doing it for exercise or not. Okay? How much is this going to cost? $800 million. This is the difference between Paying them $200 and paying them $500 is another $800 million a year to the public purse. It is 0.2% of GDP. Of course, these people are going to grow over time as a share of the population, as I, as I mentioned. So the total cost, by the time you get to 2050, is not going to be 0.2, it's going to be 0.6% of the GDP, right? compared to the 5 to 7% surplus I was mentioning. Okay, next slide, please. The other category is the unemployed poor. The problem with WIS and the working poor is that you've got to be working to get it. What happens if you're involuntarily unemployed? And many of us are going to be involuntarily unemployed if the Oxford study is saying that 30% of all jobs are going to go to robots over the next 30 years is right. Right? So we'd better have an unemployment insurance scheme worth its salt. That is to say, universal unemployment insurance of one kind or another. In fact, Donald and I were asked by uh, REACH and Professor Hui Wing Tat and we, to look at this problem, and we came together with, uh, with quite a scheme that had already been proposed in the Ministry of, fin of Finance three years before that, but has, you know, sort of like, as usual, been forgotten, and we received no, no feedback except for the Ministry of Manpower telling us that we didn't fully understand the problem because we didn't have the data, which of course they didn't give to us because they didn't, you know, it's not supposed to give to us the data. Anyway, <laughs> quite aside from that, the additional cost of this is about half a percent of GDP. So next slide, please. So we're talking about if you have unemployment insurance, you look after old people properly, the silver support scheme of $500 a month, you have WRS or five to dollars you get total bill, 4 billion, 1% of today's nominal GDP of $400 billion. Okay? Now, this, these three policies alone mean the core basic needs of the working poor 
the unemployed poor and the elderly poor will be met automatically without having to apply. And this is very important for dignity. This is very important because the poor, as well researched, have got not got the bandwidth to chase five, six, seven schemes, renew them every three months. Okay, and we're talking about a very basic level of keeping people out of the moneylenders' hands. We are not talking about any extravagances here. It eliminates completely the, the chances or almost completely falling between the cracks and discourages what we have now is family-based means testing. means to say before you're eligible for poverty, I'm going to check, is your brother, how much is he earning? Your sister, how about your mother and your father? And for most of us Chinese people, at least I can speak, if, you, if that means that my brother is going to be, you're going to talk to my brother about my unemployment benefit, you can talk to my sister, no thank you, I think you keep the money. Okay? So family-based means testing is the biggest loss of face, means that the people who really need the money never get it. They refuse to apply. Okay, so all this happens if we just have these three. So next, we also have widespread availability of subsidized HDB rental flats, as Donald mentioned. The people at the bottom cannot afford to own a flat. I don't care what DPM Thurman says about you, that if you earn $1,000, you can own a flat. It is ridiculous. If you can't pay the bills every month, yes, you can technically afford a flat, but you're going every month to the money lender to get enough money for food. And you're paying your mortgage, your CPF, no doubt. So what happens? One, you lose your job and a flat. Two, if the flat value goes up, you need to repay your money lender, right? What would you do? What would you do? You sell the flat to pay your bill. Otherwise, you get red, England, red, red, red paint on your door, right? So you sell your flat and, and you're not allowed to come back more than two bites of the cherry, right? So there's a limit. So it is not a pragmatic policy. It is a policy driven by ideology. People should be homeowners. You should be a homeowner. Not, not the original spirit of the PAP's pragmatic policy making, which is, what is it that works? This does not work. Okay? You must have uh, sufficient health care and long-term care. Uh, we can go into that later. I won't talk about it now. Sufficient educational out-of-pocket expenditures. Your kids need to go to on school trips. They don't want to be left behind every time everybody travels to Nepal. And you have sufficient subsidies for public transport. Next slide. So, the core of absolute poverty can largely be eliminated but needs government policy reforms. It will make a huge difference to nearly half a million citizens. The heavy lifting will be done for VWOs. Right now, the VWOs are supposed to do all this provision of basic needs, which by right, the government is not doing. Right? This is a public good. Do they expect VWOs to build roads for you? No. Similarly, the heavy lifting of poverty in any society is a public good. It must be supplied by the state. Right? No amount of market or voluntary charity is going to have the resources to supply it. That's it. Those are the hard facts. We can well afford it fiscally, so what are we waiting for? <laughs> change of mindset. I mean, you can have a new government with the same mindset. We have to have a change of, as Yuyen says, we have to look at them and this problem differently. Right? Next, 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 uh, ne next, please. So, I'm just going to mention here, and we can talk about this, uh, I'm not going to go into this, but we're good now, but we're going to, we can talk about this. If you really want sufficient social protection to prevent a Donald Trump scenario in Singapore, besides just poverty alleviation, you have to look at six key policy areas housing, education, healthcare, public transport, population policy, I mentioned it just now, and social security, right? These are, will never be adequately provided by the market because they are public goods. They are like roads. These are at the heart of what it means to have a decent life in the Singapore dream in Singapore. 
And you need to find the fiscal resources for this in terms of a hard policy trade-off. Good news is we have them. We can talk more about this in the Q&A. So uh, thank you very much.